Hey, Mel. Sweet, hello. Another episode of Two Writers. Talking shit. Yes. We just keep cranking them out. We are. The people want it. The people want it, and, and we deliver to the people. I just came back from Austin Film Festival, and uh, the amount of people that came up to me, hungry writers that came up to me, say they listen to our podcast. Oh, my God. They say we have chemistry, Mel. Did you, what? Do you know that? I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Who we got today? Uh, well, we've got a very special, very special guest today. A yeah. dear friend of both Saeed and myself. Yeah. Uh, a friend of the community. Um, a friend of the podcast. Um, Adrian Todd Zuniga. Hello. Hi. Welcome. How are you guys? It's so wonderful to be within uh, five and a half feet of each of you. No. I live in Melbourne, Australia now. You can hear it in the accent. Uh, the, no, but it's it's nice to be back in LA, and uh, just like the energy and vibes, and also the fact that it's like 82 degrees, but it's not hot as fuck. Like yeah. in Australia, when it's 82 degrees, it's 82 degrees. Here, it's like, oh, you're in the shade. It's like a 67 degree day. Yeah, you might need a layer in the shade. Yeah, it's nice. I definitely need a layer. I'm big on layering, big on sweaters. I should be wearing a cardigan right now. Uh, a little hot for that, but you you might you, you could rock it though. Yeah. Um, look, this is the first time we met in person, which is crazy. Wait, hilarious. Hold on, yeah. is that did true? You know that? I did not know that. Oh man, this is the first time you're flesh to flesh. I've flesh legitimately flesh. known you, I know. and I feel like an intimate friendship with Likewise. you for three ish years. Wait. Right? I know. Oh my god, this is a beautiful. I can't believe I get to wear. I, this. I feel privileged. I was like, he's yeah. exactly what I thought he Me would too. be. In time, <laughs> Me too. Know? So the internet's crazy we like that. that he's the exact <laughs> mus- <laughs> musculature. The, you know. He smells. Did he smell the way you thought he would? Smells smell. good. I didn't it smells smell. good. I never sniff people, but I should. I actually, I generally in urban settings, I hold my breath mm. and breathe through my mouth. That's just a living in New York situation, you know. I feel you. And in LA, you can just breathe. You know, take in the exhaust. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So we all met from. Mel's legendary uh, writers group that yeah. was going on during COVID, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. we were all in little Zoom squares. And sometimes Adrian would be like, oh, I'm in a village in France. And then right. he'd be like, oh, <laughs> He's I'm in the ha- world traveler. Yeah, he'd be like, I'm in Hampstead in London. And then he'd be like, right. oh, I'm at my in laws in like uh, Brisbane, you yeah. know? And yeah. like, it's here, wild. here, you know, here's the swimming pool behind us. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is hilarious because I was always in utah but i just did use different backgrounds you know to make right. you guys think mm, i yeah. was cool because i was like was. oh this will give me mystique but i was always in it like a seven foot hole trapped in utah uh there's a chair and a desk in that hole. yeah and that was it it was wild you was know great. the dedication though yeah, you yeah. know because allegedly you know sometimes because of the time zone difference it would be like <laughs> 11 p.m no. for adrian no, no. Yeah. he'd be tired and yeah we'd be but like, he'd be like I, we're gonna give these notes. Yeah, it was wild. I loved it. I Me think too. you guys are pretty great writers. So it was like it's just fun to watch. I think it's super fun, especially with you, you guys. Because if you get in a writing group where you're just not sure about people, yeah, that's one thing. Real. But if you were like, oh, my note could be the thing that unlocks something for you, that you're going to sell this. That you're, that I'm yeah. going to see this on TV and take so much credit for it. Like yeah, you know, for sure. I'm just gonna be like, oh, the show that I helped write. You know, that's what I would do if that, <laughs> if that happened. I I don't just constantly a barrage on Instagram no but it is, it is really amazing to watch people's work evolve at that level too mm-hmm. because you can give one small note and it can like change 20 pages yeah versus certain people you're like you've got to change this and they're like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you just right. read the same version next time and you're like okay that's that's a choice yeah you know so what what uh what brought you out here bro uh, I'm here to do literary deathmatch. By the time yeah. this uh, airs, this will like this will all be history, and people will look back on this month as um, legendary, month. just a legendary yeah. time. You know, yeah. where people were brought together. Yeah. But I'm going to be in. Uh, I was in Sydney doing a show, then L.A., then Ogden, Utah, then Austin, Philadelphia, Boston. I go to New York for a day. We're shooting a documentary around the tour. Wow. Well, why don't we? Let's take one step back. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell us what is literary deathmatch? Literary match? death match. You want to know? Yeah, then yeah. Let listen. the listeners know, and then also let them know how you conceived of this idea. Yeah, it's a so in two thousand six over a sushi dinner, we came up with the idea. But it's four writers reading their own work for five minutes or less, and then they're judged by three all star judges in the categories of literary merit, performance, and intangibles. Uh, the judges say lovely, strange things. We have a no meanest rule about each of the writers, and then they pick two to go to the finals, and those two compete in a vaguely literary game to decide the winner. So to give you an idea of the 
games. We played like Pin the Mustache on Hemingway. Mm. We're going to do a thing called Arithmolit in some of the coming shows. And that's basically where we take book titles with numbers and then I make an equation. So it'd be like 2666 divided by Slaughterhouse 5. And then people stand there like, I'm a fucking writer. I don't know. It's 533.2. And I only know because I just <laughs> put that in my notes recently. Because I'm like, who knows any of these answers? Like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea minus Catch 22. That's actually easy. But at the same time, like, uh, uh, you know. Maybe not on the spot, though. Right, exactly. <laughs> Especially not in front of a crowd. Right. Um, but we've done 540 of them uh, wow. in 73 cities and 80 places around the world. I don't count Flat Lake Northern Ireland is a is a city. Um, I should, but uh, yeah. So, and when I say we, mostly it's me. the royal we. It's, it's the, the royal, royal we. we. But I've had I've had a lot of help along the way. But yeah, you know, just booking. When people. did this start though? What year? Uh, Two thousand six. We did a show in New York in a place called the Back Room mm-hmm. on one of two Norfolk Street, a bar that I love. Mm-hmm. Um, it actually has a bookshelf that pushes open a, a, into a hidden room. Um, hidden room isn't impressive, but the rest places. And uh, yeah, and then I was um, I was doing it in New York, and then I met this woman that I I had met, I think in Scotland, just on a trip, or or maybe I was in China and met her. But anyway, she was running the door at a Pen America Festival mm-hmm. event, and she was like, "Are you still doing that cool new show you do? That's like a year old." I was like, "Yeah, it's going really well." And she's like, "You should bring it to Beijing." Wow. And I was like, "Uh, uh-huh. oh." Yeah, I guess we could, right? Yeah. So when we went to Beijing, I was like, oh, shit, we can do this anywhere. Mm. Like, anywhere there are four writers and three funny people, we can do it. Right. So that sort of launched it, going around the world. And um, I lived in London for a time. Now I'm doing it in Australia. We got a, we've got a $15,000 grant to do two shows Fire. next year, waiting for a $200,000 grant to do four shows. Uh, but it's a lot of media stuff. But yeah, so uh, I don't know. We'll see. I've tried to get it on TV. Sky Arts said yes once. And the he, the guy was like, uh, "I'll get back to you like two or three months. I just have to get my affairs in order, and then we're gonna we're gonna make this happen." And then he quit like a month later. And then so WME was repping us at the time, and I was like, oh, "Okay, so the next guy is just gonna take it forward." Right. <laughs> and I didn't. I was so naive in the industry at that point. I didn't realize like basically the new guy comes in, puts his arm on the desk, and just sweeps everything into the trash, and is like, "What do we got?" Mm. You know. And I was like, "Fuck, okay." Then PBS said they wanted to do it, which wasn't great. Like WME was like, mm, there's no money. Uh, and then that guy left a couple oh, weeks later. Shit. And I was like, okay, whatever. But you know, so now we're, we're we're taking another swing generally. But who knows? Soon, soon enough. Soon. Yeah. I mean, I I was meeting with this uh, writer Matt Okine in Brisbane. He created the show The Other Guy. Yeah. He stars in it. It's one of my favorite shows. It's an Australian show as well. And um, and he was just like. He's like, what's the, like, how do you sell it? And I, I have, like, all these ways to sell as a TV show. But mm-hmm. I was, the one thing I said, I was like, if we, if people want to watch hot people sell real estate, then we can pull this off. Like, this can mm-hmm. succeed, right. too, mm-hmm. in, like, a totally yeah. different way. Yeah. But he was like, that's a pretty good pitch, you know? Like, yeah. reality TV accommodates everything. So I'm like, we can get this. It's so fun and so vibrant and funny and like surprising. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, give people kind of like a little it, cuz it's like it's like kind of a hard idea to kind of wrap your right. mind around if you've never seen it. But like give people an idea of like kind of like what kind of guests you have on. Like what kind of right. names are we talking about? Yeah, so like Diablo Cody has judged. Um, one time fine. Nicole Byer judged and she was judging performance and she compared everyone to a Whoopi Goldberg movie. <laughs> and that was just hilarious. That was at Largo in Los Angeles. Um, Neil Gaiman's judged. He's Tight. he's he's a hot property. A legendary. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, author wise, we've had over three thousand. One time we had uh, Jeffrey Eugenides judge mm-hmm. and he had years before told me he's like I'm never going to do that. I was like, all right, I'll wait you out. And then he happened to be in Helsinki when I was, and we needed a judge. And I found out he was there. And so I, I was like, I've got his email because we met this one time and hung out at this after party. I was like, I'm just going to go for it. And he wrote back and he's like, yeah, sounds fun. That's tight. And, uh, and we ended up having a great, I mean, he, he and I were the only people doing the show in English. And this woman, that was a show that this woman read who had won like major, major Finnish awards. It was crazy that she was doing the show. It'd be like mm-hmm. somebody who won the National Book Award, the Pulitzer, and was like in line for the Nobel Prize and was like, sure, I'll read it, your show. <laughs> and while she was reading, this woman that was in the crowd that I knew 
uh, she kept looking back at me because everybody was dying laughing. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'm loving this. I don't know what she's saying. But my friend got up, she popped back, and she was like, do you know what's happening? And I'm like, I have no idea. It's in Finnish. She said she came on and said, I want to lose, so I'm going to read poetry that I wrote when I was 10. Mm. But then when she started reading it, it was like, clearly a through line to what she ended up publishing as an adult and what made her a success. Mm -hmm. So people, it was like this ironic kind of like thing that was happening. Anyway, it was like killing the crowd. Everybody's like in throes of laughter and loving it. And then she ended up winning the whole show. That's so, crazy. That's pretty cool. But yeah, we've had tons of celebrities, tons of people you haven't heard of that have become huge stars. Um, it's pretty wild. It's that good. Like our sizzle reel that we shot in 2012, that's got Tig Notaro, uh, Keegan Michael Key, a bunch mm. of no names, but no, like Tig was <laughs> Tig was awesome then, but mm. now her career's obviously exploded, yeah. and she's done so many great things, and Keegan's extraordinary, and um, yeah, so it's just like it's it's wild. It it's interesting because I feel like I was about like the wheels were falling off the bus when COVID happened because mm -hmm. I am m much of a one man show, and I was just like, man, this is a lot of work, and then COVID hit. And I don't know, I just sort of reset. Now I'm loving it again. It's like fun to do it again. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that shit is dope. Shout out RK Russell. He's uh, he's at yours this time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Me and him working on a television show together off his book. And um, that's dope, man. Hell yeah. How how's that going? Can I ask? Can we talk? Can I talk <laughs> back? As a I, guest? Love, I love how he's like he's a he's a guest uh, podcaster. Yeah. Also. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's going dope, bro. We're um. You know, the strike happened for five months, and so now we're back. Um, right strike. before we, yeah, no, I wish it. <laughs> I wish it was. I wish I could like uh, men in black myself and forget about it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, it's going good. Now we're uh, just polishing it up. We got some new execs there, and so uh, I think we're taking it out January, February. Oh so, man, fingers that's crossed. awesome. Yeah, it's such a cool story, and he's such an interesting guy. Yeah, and like. Before I asked him to do it, I mean, I knew about his work through you, but I was like Googling, watching interviews, and he's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So, such a cool dude. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm pretty fired up about that. Um, video games, man. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Listen, that. listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of them is a, is a very, uh, you know, uh, what they call it, like uh, underground title called Madden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, nobody's heard of it. It is wild. So, uh, yeah, my best friend since I was 10... He was a creative director at Madden, and I'd written with Madden before. I'd done like they opened up a Twitter system where I had to write as like Skip Bayless and stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and Marshall Falk and all these people. That's crazy. And yeah, so I, I remember one birthday when I had first moved to LA, I had to write. I I think it was like ten thousand tweets, and I had like four days. Holy shit! <laughs> I was like, wait, what? I was like, how did I let this slide? And it might have been a thousand. It might have been five thousand. But in my mind, it was like ten thousand. But basically, my like all through my birthday, basically from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., I was just writing these tweets and my brain was starting to come out of my ear. Um, but then years later, they were going to do a narrative version, uh, a narrative thing. Um, and my friend called me. He had read uh, a script of mine that is now a short film that I'm now going to try to make into a feature. And, uh, and when he called me, he's just like, Hey, we're going to like write a movie, like a playable mm -hmm. movie. And it was, the coolest thing because it was like I knew enough about how to write mm -hmm. these things but like every I suddenly I was like oh shit I'm really doing this I'm about yeah. to be paid to write a thing so I was just listening to podcasts around the clock and like this it's like we listen to a lot of podcasts or we study writing or whatever in our different ways but this stuff was like locking into my mind I was like okay I have mm -hmm. to make sure I'm thinking of this and just in creating characters and story arcs blah, blah. and uh, it was just like a boot camp I put myself through to do this and he's much more he directed it and he wrote it but also he's much more of the director guy and mm -hmm. I'm much more of the writer guy and it was just like a really emotional process and um, I just the, the script is a very emotional thing but you know it's really about two friends trying to support each other while having their own selfish dreams mm -hmm. and how that comes in conflict and uh, yeah it was really extraordinary Scott uh, Porter was the best friend um, uh, JD, I'm, I'm my brain is oh JR Lemon, sorry, uh, was the lead, and he's amazing. Um, but what was the 
wildest shit in the world is Mahershala Ali plays the father. Yeah. And he's only on screen for maybe two minutes, yeah. but he's saying stuff I wrote. I Fire. mean, that's like yeah. unbelievable. Uh, I mean, he's really, and that was right around the time Moonlight came out. So yeah. I'm just like, holy fuck, this is the movie that's changed my life. And uh, yeah, the whole thing was just so cool. And we ended up, it was a six month contract. So I ended up writing a lot of the sequel in the last month and a half. And Sorry. I was let just, run free and we ended up making the sequel but that one didn't have the interactive stuff because they were trying to I, I don't think EA was into it they were just like yeah we're doing this but we're not you know the story part of it yeah, yeah. and it ended up winning us it was like they weren't into it and then it won game of the year because of that yeah and then they greenlit the second one fire and then it was just I don't know it, it was an interesting thing like it's like probably all production stuff. If they, they wanted it to be a certain thing, we made it like an emotional mm -hmm. dude story about two men who love one another. But, yeah. you know, it's like that's an interesting thing for them because they're like, no, we want to hit people. So I think it's a little confusing. <laughs> but then when it won the award, they're like, oh, fuck. And we got nominated for the Writers Guild Award. Fire. And uh, yeah. that was cool. That Like I yeah. got to talk to Jordan Peele at that event about my novel that I'm now finishing. And it was like, hey, man, Get Out was a big inspiration for my... That's and I fire. just wanted to tell him, and he's like, mm -hmm. how so? And I'm like, oh, shit, the show's about to start in 10 seconds. <laughs> like, you actually going to talk to me about this? <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay, well... I'm a... yeah. And then I was like, oh, thank you, bye. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was cool. But yeah, just doing doing a video game thing and just trying to take it as serious as a film. Yeah. And then that got us a lot of meetings and led to us writing the script that... Uh, we've got basically funding for and the book rights, we can't seem to get the writer of the book to email oh, us back. Shit. And it's causing, it's like now in this wild legal situation that is just like, we're just trying to give you money. And yeah. like six figures of money. I feel like if somebody was mm -hmm. just like, you can either uh, deal with a lawsuit and pay any dollar amount or you can just make you know, like a year's salary, and I don't know. I, I don't know how much I should talk about this, but anyway, I, okay. Like, yeah, well, we don't want to get you in hot water, Adrian. Yeah, I've yeah, got a question. It. Say, do you play video games? Definitely. You do. I do. Do you play? Like, have you ever played a have you Madden? Played Longshot? Have you played Longshot? Play Madden for sure. And I played Longshot. Yeah, you definitely like, wait, played. So you, I know. You've huh? played Adrian's game. Well, I didn't know Adrian at the time. Right. <laughs> but oh, but you yeah, played no. the game. Yeah. I, I, well, but so how is it? Tell us for real. No, yeah. I mean it was good. Like, I mean, I think the funny thing about those games is, uh, yeah, when you're playing against a friend online. You want to just play football, right? But when you're playing by yourself, and there's a thing where you can like create a player and like you do the story mode, like all that shit is tight to me. Well, did you did cry you, or oh. did you laugh? That's all I care about. Oh, yeah. Are you one of the people that was on Twitter that said it sucked, and then I nah. wrote back, I go, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, did a lot of that. Nah, I, I laughed and I, I thought it was, I thought it was good. I, I like those campaigns. Yeah, yeah. Where they have the story modes. Yeah. So is it like okay? Explain it to me because I oh, okay. I haven't played a video game since like Duck Hunter on like Nintendo I whatever like that. that. Duck Hunter. Duck Hunter. <laughs> you just threw oh, ER shit. on there. Which, is, which, <laughs> which is classic. It is yeah. Duck Hunt was a, It's Duck Hunt. Oh okay. Yeah, I mean, Duck Hunter, but <laughs> but like these the the kind of video games we're talking about now. It's like it's like a, it's a full story, yeah. and it's like is it sort of like a choose your own adventure kind of story? To a point. At times. Yeah. yeah, like that was an interesting thing that we had to learn was how do you write an interactive story to where it's branches, right? Oh. And we finally were like, oh, we have to thematically decide what this story is about right. and what these characters believe. Because mm. we didn't want to like, yes, no binary because mm. it's like they end up saying stuff that's dumb and doesn't matter. So we're like, oh, how do we have them say stuff that's meaningful but still like guide the story forward no matter what you choose, right? So that it didn't just feel like you're going, yes, I want a taco. Right. You know, like we didn't want that. But there is a moment early on in it uh, like you leave at 4 a.m. in the morning to drive to go do the football uh, combine or whatever. You're doing like the, yeah, the nobody's try guy. Yeah, yeah, the tryout. And there's this moment where you have to, <laughs> you like pull off to pee. And this is all kind of very oh. montage in the first 10 minutes. But your friend films 
you on Instagram ping and you can he chooses you choose to upload it or not he's oh, like turn that off what are you doing shit. and like if you upload it there's a joke later and if you don't yeah. there okay. isn't you know it's like so that kind of like yeah. humor just to be like yeah this we're just goofing around like it's emotional but we definitely wanted to be funny yeah. yeah um and do you approach it like the same way you would approach writing a feature yeah so basically okay. what we learned is we wrote the best fucking movie we could write that was 120 pages long and then we had to be like oh here's a decision point mm. now we have to write that scene again but different and yeah. it's like oh that would be the second best scene because we yeah. we worked our ass off to be like no this is the scene we have to do it this way this is the best and then it was like oh well it's a branching point so we have to okay well if he wants to do a different thing if these stupid gamers I'm kidding no but just like <laughs> writing a scene that wasn't as good in mm. my mind you know it's like mm. ah he wouldn't do this well you might do this okay well this is how we would do it mm. so yeah so mm. there was so that would take you like maybe two pages of dialogue max and uh yeah, it was it was really interesting, and I highly recommend nobody ever making video games independently. But uh, <laughs> if you can, <laughs> go forth. But the, it's it's like really it's writing, you know. It's like it's to make it as good as it has to be. Like people can't brush past the writing. And I think for years, video games were written by guys who work there that just yeah. like graduated up, and now they're smart enough to be like, no, we need we need writers to do mm. this. Yeah, so. like when you when you first, you know, when you when you play Nintendo. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the Zelda writing is so, like, if you look at it now, it, 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 they're not even saying it, it's just words that come across uh, yeah. the screen. Yeah, yeah. But it's so basic. And it's, it, uh, nine times out of 10, it's not written by a writer, it's just written right. by a programmer. Well, one thing in Zelda that I like puzzled over forever was there's a line right at the beginning when you get the sword and it says, Master using it and you can have it. And I could not figure out that meant master using the sword. If you master using this sword, then you can have it, right? right. I was like, master using it? What? <laughs> Who's master? <laughs> what the fuck is going on? I don't know. Master using it? I don't know. And you can have... What? I just couldn't... Like, now I probably am even uh, intonating to where it's understandable. But at that age, I was just like, what is this? What? Mm. Yeah. I just want the sword. I don't yeah, know. You just want to get to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, wild. now, okay, a true renaissance man. Yeah. Adrian conceived of literary deathmatch. He's like a little elfin performing, <laughs> leading, doing jokes about Hemingway all over the world. He writes, uh, you know, award-winning video games. Mm -hmm. He's also a published author. Yeah. Okay. He's got a novel out that. called Collision Theory. Yeah. So... A novel feels long, right? Like, if I think about, like... Like, a screenplay is already, like, 90 pages. That already it feels so long to me. Like... It, when I because I have dreams of writing a novel I think Saeed both we all, do, we, yeah. we all have dreams yeah. of, we'd love to be published authors yeah. we'd love to be on literary death match that's know, the only happening. reason we have you on this podcast I know, <laughs> I know. for real side but it's like when I think about like the 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 vo like the volume the length, of yeah. words that I've got to put together to write a novel like I wouldn't even know where to begin like how, like how do you approach that uh, and what came first, novels or screenwriting, screenplays? Definitely novels. Like sh my lineage is short stories to book to screenplay. Mm. Okay. So yeah, that's my that's Makes my sense. sequence, and maybe some poetry <laughs> before that. You cool, know? Yeah. Like to write to girls that would as be you like should, as I one does. Not yeah. And now and as I've evolved to like women, then it was like okay, I've gotta I gotta try to make some money. Yeah. So that's what you know. Short That's all they really care about cut. at the end of the day. Uh, right, right, you know right, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, can't, can't be a broke poet forever. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I think that's something that me and you both know. Like, yeah, 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 one yeah, thing yeah. we know for sure is do not be a broke poet forever. Yeah, go it's not gonna it's not it's gonna, not gonna, get gonna get you work what well. You're after. Yeah. Um, Might be alone for yeah. your whole life, but go the ahead. whole yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say like writing my novel was just like a burst of enthusiasm. And my feeling is like, if you've written 50 pages of a novel, you've written a book. Like you mm. will finish that book if you want. Um, like my debut novel, I wrote 13 years before it was published and oh. it took me about nine months. And then it took, like, then I'd re-edit it every three, you know, three, six, nine months later. And it just, it actually, by the time it got published, it was really holding me back as a creative person. Because I was just like, I fucking love this book so much. Yeah. I love it. And it's good enough. But it it's like good enough to be published, but it wasn't great. And then finally, I got somebody who was going to uh, agent it and publish it. And then that's what got me like the last 15%. Like I just, 
it was such an interesting thing that I just couldn't figure out certain parts of it. And when I work with an editor, he's like, this is what your book's really about. And I was like, no, no, it's not about mental illness. It's about just a guy who happens to see a ghost. (laughs) No, it's not. And he was like, bro, let me just sit you down. And I was like, oh shit. Yeah. This is a book because it was, your first novel is very autobiographical generally. So it had like this energy and headlong nature to it. And I couldn't, I couldn't compromise the lead character. I was always protecting the lead character because in some way, no matter how far away he got from being me, I was like, well, I have to protect him, you know? And that, uh, that the first chapter of that book, which is about three pages long, is some of the best writing I've ever done. That's fire. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a man goes up to a rooftop just to like hang out and read, sit in the sun, and he sees a woman who's about to jump and kill herself. And he's never seen her before. She's beautiful. And he's like, we'll go around the world. You know, we'll have too much sangria in Spain. I'll hold your hair back. We'll go here. We'll do this. We'll, like, we'll do it, right? And what ends up happening within three pages is she jumps and kills herself. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, like, when that happens, that's like, oh, fuck. What? Like, mm-hmm. I thought this was going to be mm-hmm. this. And at my, like, genre bendy nature, that sort of comprises that thing. Um, and then it turns into a book about, you know avoiding which is dope you, you you said a couple things in there one is um i always talk about when you write even when i'm developing shows i'm always trying to bend tropes and stereotypes mm. Mm. so it's like to play with the audience's perception of what they think it's the best and then also another thing you said that i really had to learn when it came to writing television pilots is like stop being like we love our main character so much mm. but like in tv which i want to talk to you about um like you have to throw rocks at it put obstacles in the way all the time like I almost had to get to a point I was telling somebody yesterday it's like when I write a pilot it's like what every time it's like what's the worst thing that could happen to this character like you know what I'm saying even though I love this character and I just I want him just be cruising through life yeah yeah well the other thing that I've learned especially lately is it's not just like like how many how hard can you hit this guy because I like one of the philosophies I have one of the core tenets of my writing is keep making it worse for your characters yeah but one of the things I'm now using consistently that I, I think I, it speaks to this is like also, uh, make the character flawed in a way that like they can't get out of their own way Mm. because that is so painful to watch. When you see somebody know the decision they should make, that's the right decision. (laughs) And they they don't. don't, And you're like, what the fuck you, you said, Two minutes ago, that if you get confronted with a situation like this, you know you're going to do the right thing now because you learned your lesson, and you watch them not do it, and you're like, "This fucking idiot! Come on, you know you know the right thing," and it's really interesting because I I just wrote a half hour, uh, and the premise is basically three guys, one twenty seven, one thirty seven, one forty seven, all experience breakups, and they're all about to move into a house alone, and they all show up about the same time, and they're like, "What the fuck?" and they find (laughs) out that they've been they, they're about to move into a three bedroom apartment and they're like, this is bullshit. What the fuck? <laughs> and, uh, and the generational difference is all this. But what, one thing that was really interesting to me is just like, I had a concept for that, but I wasn't beating up the characters enough. Mm-hmm. And I learned that cause I watched Dave, yep. which I mm. like, I know you've seen, and I don't know if you've seen Melanie, mm-hmm. but I, Oh, we talked about it on this show before. We'll get oh, into I mean, it later. We're going. <laughs> like to me, that show comprises exactly what I I I fucking love that show. Me too. I cannot believe how much I love it. And episode nine of the season pod, one, season one, yeah. and that's when his girlfriend. That's when he says something that's very dear to me because I have also written a autobiographical pilot about literary death match called a novel idea, which is basically like me just failing through the world mm-hmm. and. In the end of that episode, he's having a fight with his girlfriend, but he's basically like, my entire self-worth is tied to me becoming this famous rapper. Right. Mm. And Mm. I'm like, oh, fuck. That's very real to me. Like, my (laughs) entire self-worth is tied to me succeeding as a writer and a performer. Like, to try to, like, do something creative and have enough of a hit that it pays for my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't need Mm -hmm. a big life, but it would be nice to, like... You know, not to have to worry or, or to get an opportunity to do the thing that also I want to do or whatever. You know, just like my friend yesterday while we were shooting this literary deathmatch documentary just asked me, like, what's my idea of success? And I was like, well, what layer? What? He's like, just shut, fucking answer. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I said, it's to be able to do whatever I want creatively. Like to, to right. open that door and be like, I really believe in this. And now I'm much more mature and I've chosen projects better that I'm working on. But it's like, Let's walk through the door of like, I know this is going to be good. And it might not be a hit, but I know I'm going to do it to where thematically and 
character-wise is going to be resonant or upsetting or whatever. But anyway, so that's a lot of talk to say Dave, like that's a character who can't stop. Yeah, he can't get out his mm-hmm. own way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh man, that's a rough, that's rough to watch sometimes, but you also sympathize with it, which mm-hmm. I didn't used to understand that, that audiences sympathize yeah. when a character can't get it right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh yeah, we all fucking, we're all doing this all the time. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. Also, my new novel's uh, almost finished and man I tr- my goal with this new novel is to win the Pulitzer Prize no joke and Zadie Smith said a thing I read years ago which was everybody starts out to write the greatest novel ever written and at the end all you're trying to do is finish your novel like all you want to do is write your book mm. and finish your book mm. and I'm like oh, I'm, that's so true to me right now I'm like yeah so anyway the point that you asked about Melanie earlier is like to write a book you've you've been writing essays i love your essays they're so funny well did those have have you compiled those of you what's happening <laughs> tell me about your life we could talk about this off camera i love <laughs> i just want to know what's going on with you guys <laughs> Um, well, I will say that I did have this goal um, to become published, even like, you know, to sh- start in small steps of like having an essay published. Um, but I haven't even written like those pitch emails, you know, when you like pitch oh, the editor the of like, hmm. you know, whoever the hell, I don't even, this is how far I've gotten. I don't even know what website I'm writing to. Um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't even written those pitch emails with like my catchy title of like mm-hmm. my essay to kind of like sell them on it. So that's why not where I'm at. Well, <laughs> you know, because I have problems, it right. ran, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's called <laughs> self hate, right. uh, low self esteem, uh, yeah. self sabotage. The list goes on. But they're great. I'll, I have one of those. It's <laughs> self sabotage. My big issue is that when uh, historically it's like I get to a cusp of success and I pull back mm. and I have all these reasons like, why I need to have more scripts ready or I need to have more I need to be funnier I need to write better jokes or whatever it is it's like no what do you think's behind that fear of success uh, I don't have a fear of failure which is interesting I have a fear mm. of success yeah. and so now I've now that I've gotten older and I'm like oh I see that if I don't push forward here I am going to be doing work I don't care about and making money off stuff that I don't love mm. and so it's like I get a like it's time and also I'm ready like I'm like the work I'm doing is good enough now Mm -hmm. to be produced and to produce and to like go forward like I truly believe that and again it might not be a hit but at least I think it would find some audience and I just think it would be like I would when it was finished I would stand back and I'd be like that I stand behind that I'm Mm -hmm. proud of that work Mm -hmm. and so that's the big thing and but yeah so literally Capitalism. I write, I'm like, <laughs> most of my work nowadays is like something to do with late stage capitalism and like being like, oh, this is the world we live in and it's fucking gross. And here I am being like, well, I just want the, the early yeah. stage capitalism. I'm all for that, you know, but. Uh, also, I've having read your work, um, one thing I really like about your writing, not only is it like personal, um, but the dialogue is good. No, thanks. Mm. And so do you have any advice for, you know, like the the show is really geared toward upcoming writers. Do you yeah. have any advice on writing good dialogue? And, 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 you know, what do you think about when you're writing dialogue? Yeah, if we just want to stop talking about my past and start talking craft, <laughs> this is my passion. Oh, like, all what, I want to do. That's what the whole yeah, yeah. next year Sorry is. about the last fucking 49 hours <laughs> of this <laughs> podcast. Okay. Uh, when I... I'd be curious to hear how you guys do it, but, like, I basically go into this weird zone and I just start I just I think everything is an argument but I I used to not think about it that way I was just like I'm the last of eight kids and I basically am just like everybody's right everybody thinks they're right Right. so just type Mm -hmm. what they just have them say the thing that they think is true one of the problems in one with my writing that I've learned is to create subtext but I always open with just like here's what I think and here's Mm -hmm. what I want and the other person is like well that's dumb you know Mm -hmm. you're selfish Mm -hmm. there's a first you know and it's like just have people speak the direct truth Mm -hmm. and then what I've learned is if you sort of waylay that or delay that a bit and then you have them start speaking the truth then it feels like oh shit this is popping now yeah so like the more truth that gets said and the more directly it gets said that's like that's just like a thunderclap that can come in and you can at any point have somebody tell the truth i just saw anatomy of a fall have you guys seen that no i saw i'm about to though yeah yeah they're like you realize that european people behave differently than americans americans are very obfuscating or like we don't we never want to 
be wrong or we don't want to actually upset anybody. We're just like caging in a weird way um, until we get mad or until we yeah. get emotional. And then we tell the truth. Europeans are just like, I'm going to tell you exactly <laughs> what the truth is. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like you just said that your husband isn't attractive enough to sleep with other. I mean, this isn't in the movie, but <laughs> you'll just say a thing. And then he has to be like, well, that is true. But also but you, I got too. Yeah. You, you aren't any great. You chicks. Win, yeah. yeah. You're terrible at sex. Uh, <laughs> but like when I write dialogue, I think that's the number one thing I've learned. It's just like, and also don't worry, like just start, like have yeah. people say shit. I think one of the things that's actually sabotaged my dialogue is screenwriting. Because mm. when I'm screenwriting mm. and I'm very aware of like, okay, structurally. Confinement. Yeah, confinement. Like, okay, I need to get, I got like 15 pages to do. Got to get, get from A to B. Yeah, it's like what you, what I'm trying to figure out right now with my writing and with the next project that I'm developing with a friend right now is just like, can we just have people just fucking chumming it up like how do you do that and how much space can that take mm. and like then it's like well I have to infuse character plot a little bit but also there are certain movies that I see where people are just talking about something dumb and it's so pleasurable and if it's funny and if it's fast you're just like I'm on board with this. Yeah. This has nothing to do with the story, but I'm just, I love that he just talked about fucking Twinkies and how they're basically made of plastic or whatever people say, you know? And it's like, that ultimately is character, but like, l just let it rip. I think that's the thing. Don't worry about getting from point A to B because you're going to eventually have to shape that. Um, and of course this is, this means, I mean, that's the one thing with screenwriting too, is you're just like, well, anytime I let loose, that's more editing than I have to do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like characters are, f we're weird, man. People mm -hmm. are weird. Like mm -hmm. if you just literally listen to someone talk about whatever, they're not saying exactly what they need to say to get into the next scene. Like they're all over the map. Listen to me. I mean, this is, <laughs> I sound like a fucking idiot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, no, I don't agree with that. But <laughs> what do you, how do you think of it? Like when you're like, I'm going to write this scene or I'm going to write this character or dialogue. Yeah, I want to hear this from Mel too because it's interesting. I, I I like all three of our dialogues. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because, like, lately I've been, even when I was at Austin Film Fest, a lot of people are like, if you could write good dialogue, like, they fuck with you. Like, you know what I'm saying? And right. so I, I, I really think uh, I listen a lot yeah. to people. And uh, I just, I try to get them in a scene and just let them talk. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, don't, I don't like getting the middle of it until it's editing time. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of just try to keep it organic. And I, I do speak when I, uh, when I do write, especially on read back yeah. what I wrote. Like, I, I do talk the, the dialogue. Yeah. What about cool. you, Mel? Yeah. You don't even want to know. I do want to know. Well, I, I bet like, you were acting your shit out in full. <laughs> oh, are you? Yeah, your shit is raw. Like, I love your dialogue because yeah. it's so spiked with, like, like, Energy. I don't want to say vitriol, but there's like you're not afraid to drop in a like, oh, go fucking come on somebody's back. I don't want to hear yeah. it. You say some <laughs> raw <laughs> nasty shit. <laughs> directly, <laughs> but you say some like raw shit it's that I'm just like, you. oh yeah, right, it'll like, shock you. Yeah, and I think about it. I'm like, my friends and I talk like this when we're being ridiculous. Right. So like, how do you get there, or how do you do it? You know, it's interesting. I do have a similar um, approach Please. as our friend, friend Saeed here. <laughs> um, coming from like a playwriting background, like all you have is dialogue, right? right. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying nothing happens in a play, <laughs> but ultimately <laughs> all we see is like people talking to each other on stage and they, something can happen off stage and they can talk about it, but like that's it. Like there's no plane crashes. There's no like, you know, nothing. Yeah. Um, so... My initial approach when I first started playwriting was like exactly like as Saeed phrased it, which is like, I have these two characters. I'm going to put them in this situation together. I'm going to put them in this room together. I'm just going to let them talk to each other. And I'm just going to see what they have to say. And so mm -hmm. I really sort of allow myself to let the characters voice themselves, you know, and, um, when I really, when I really, that's the thing that I, I find, I find dialogue far easier than like structure or any of that. Of I'm like trash okay. at structure. And I mean, yeah. talk about like, um, I'm taking a pilot writing class right now. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to talk about structure when we're done with yeah. Oh, we're about yeah. to talk about structure <laughs> yeah. next, so I can't wait. Uh, shout out to Why our not? prior uh, podcast Ellie. guest, Ellie Lockman. I'm taking her her pilot yeah. writing class. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, I did have like a moment of like, 
Should I be taking a class? And then I said to myself, Halle Berry takes acting classes. The hell am I to think that like I shouldn't be taking like a pilot writing class? Yeah. And what I've come to learn in the classes, I have no idea how to write a pilot, mm. um, which is pretty crazy because it's like it, there's so much structure involved and we're like having to like do all these beats, something that I have absolutely never done in approaching a script. Like it's so structural and like um, they said something in the last class that like kind of like really stuck with me and which was like, Oh, like the dialogue is like the least important thing. You've got to nail all this. And I mm. said, well, I'd like to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> My dialogue's pretty fucking good. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I think that's really interesting. I, I, by the way, just talking about this, I'm like my next screenplay. I think I might just write the dialogue in a word doc. I don't use word mm. pages, baby mm. all the way. But yeah, <laughs> I might write it that way because I think there's something about writing it in a page because then you start getting to page three and you're like, oh, this conversation is mm-hmm. too long. Like, mm-hmm. I got to be careful. Um, whereas, like, if you just write it in a way where you're like, I'm unconfined, like, I'll, I'll just copy and paste this over and it'll take me an extra 10 minutes. But that seems very compelling to me right now because I think what you're saying about being a play, mm-hmm. like, playwriting is just different, right? Because mm-hmm. you're, you're getting character in there all the time. And... I, like I was just thinking while you're talking about that, I'm like I'm about to write a character who refuses to take responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. That's such a fun character to write because mm-hmm. if somebody mm-hmm. goes, "You fucking did this," he's like, "Or oh, what are you talking about?" You know, like yeah. just I think that's like so interesting to me. And I just realized if I wrote that in a pages doc, I'd write it better the first time. So I don't know. That's it. Structure. Structure. Before time. before b- before we come to our last couple questions, structure. Um, it's interesting because a lot of writers that I, you know, a lot of my mentors, they say like structure is something you learn. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, some didn't learn till they were on their third show or whatever. Because usually the show, like if you're a staff writer, you don't have to worry about structure, right? Because like the showrunner is doing the structure. Right. Now, obviously, your pilot needs to have some kind of form of structure. But how did you approach structure? So I didn't know fuck all about structure until like four years ago. And then now I have a complete system by which I create structure. And one of the things I will tell people out there that don't worry if you were a good writer and you started to learn structure and now you're writing sex a little bit compared to what you thought because mm-hmm. you used to be free and you mm-hmm. could just write mm-hmm. and now you're like, oh, I got to structure shit. Because now finally, and I was worried about this for a, like a good year and a half, I am finally now creating work that is independent of structure as what it was before I learned, but it is now within a structure mm-hmm. and I'm not thinking about the structure and the writing is better. Cause I, there was a period of time where I was like, I'm so obsessed with structure. Yeah. This sucks, man. I'm fucking up. Like mm. this is not, I used to be a good writer and now I'm not. And now I'm finally like, I've grown out of that, but the structure is now embedded in how I think about things. So I have this system, I call it the ATZV and it's basically <laughs> like this, this thing where I have uh, seven boxes like in a V form Mm -hmm. that are all going right to left. So uh, the first one is opening, uh, opening scene, opening Mm -hmm. image, Mm -hmm. and then opposite it with a line going across is closing image. And then the next layer of the V is uh, inciting incident and then climax. The next one is first act break, second act break, and then the bottom one is the midpoint. So like by just having these seven boxes and filling those in and then having arrows that connect them, because once I figured out the inciting incident connects the climax and yeah. the first act break to the second act break, I was like, oh, that's that makes sense, mm-hmm. right? Because you're dealing with smaller and smaller stories. In the midpoint, like this was a huge revelation that I got from my friend because he became obsessed with structure and he, write, he watched all the Marvel movies uh, in the first run of them and he he took notes. He was just like obsessive. He's like, I want to figure out how the fuck they do this and are so successful. And what he realizes the midpoint is always the character gets what they want. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, to me, the sound of metal with Riz Ahmed is one of the most beautiful structural movies, thematically structural, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. But that's my first thing is I try to figure out what the character wants and I give it to them. And then as soon as possible, I take it away. Like Mm -hmm. I, I cut their legs out from under them. And that thing, of course, is like the it's not what they want, it's what they need, you know, that's what they need to achieve. And then that's more connected to the second act break and all that stuff. But uh 
or the climax. And so that's my first port of call when I'm just like, I got this story. I just want to make sure that I'm hitting these beats. Mm Because the one thing I learned early about screenwriting is if you just write a screenplay, you basically created nine (laughs) months of work. You cannot, you got to stop and just be like, okay, is this fitting in this structure? Um, And then you're going to get stuck. Like I used to run into, like when I did an outline, I would like, once I get to like page 30 or 40, I'm like, oh man, where the fuck am I going to like, the the, the middle, like you might have the ending, but it's like, how the fuck do I get there now? Yeah. So and this like makes me at least go like, okay, I, I know see where I'm, it. yeah. I see the lamppost. So good. And then what I'll do is I'll listen to Craig Mazin's How to Write a Movie. Yep, and that gives me the good thematic one. arc. So now I've got the structural arc, then I have a thematic arc that I check it against. Then I watch, um, ah, fuck, I'm jet lagged. <laughs> the guy who did- uh, Mike Arndt. Mike Arndt. Arndt. Yeah, Michael Arndt's yeah. Uh, How to Write an Ending. Or, uh, yeah, it's uh, like Pixar, the thing, right? Is that- it's, it's the uh, thing about writing an amazing ending. Is this a oh, YouTube video? Yeah, that's yeah. Him too. Okay. Michael, video. He, he we'll has, link, we got a link to that video. He has yeah. multiple ones. He has the yeah. one about accent and he has the, because he uses uh, that movie with the girl that runs. Uh, he uses. Uh, his, run Lola Run? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. He uses uh, so The yellow. Graduate, Star Wars, and his movie uh, yep. about the little girl. That's what I'm talking about. The yeah, one yeah. Who little Miss Sunshine? Little Miss Sunshine. Sunshine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Only yeah. took three of us. Because he said he wanted to write the perfect ending of right. all time. Mm. And yeah. so he did. He did. He did. <laughs> like, mm. His whole philosophy is that the perfect ending, I think, is like less than two minutes. Yeah. And in The Graduate, he does it. He shows. He like has a clock going. Mm. Yeah. And like once I started realizing that having a perfect ending yeah. then informed the first act, I think I think yeah. when I was reading one of your films, I was like, watch this because I think yeah. your ending doesn't reflect the beginning. And effectively, it's like Billy Wilder said, if you have a problem in the third act, your, act, yeah. your problem is in the first act. Yeah. And it's like, oh, shit. Like, and so once I do the Mason in that, and now I've got a new one that I'm starting to add on. Have you guys heard of the nutshell technique? Yeah. I, yeah. Saw, I saw somebody talking about that maybe on Film Courage or something. It was like a woman talking about it. Yeah. 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 It's like that one is like the perfect fourth element because it really forces my first act to understand like one thing I really struggle with for years and then I figured it out and now this opens up a a possibility for me to figure out in a more complex and interesting way it's just like what does the character want the character only gets one want Mm -hmm. right and she was like, no, the, the first act is basically, I forget what she calls it, but it's the want that matters in a sense because it's the thing that triggers the story to change and all this shit. And I would always struggle because I'm like, well, my character wants like five things. Like I have to pick one. It's like she helped me understand like there's the one that changes everything, but you can still have all these wants going on. You know, this character can be more complex than like one thing. And that was really interesting to me. And just the idea of the flaw, like going from flaw to strength. Yeah. And that being in opposition. So that's it deals a little bit with theme or arc. But yeah, so it's like my, what I learned is like I didn't want to be tied to anyone's structural path. That's when I created my V because that like gave me access to the story that I needed. And then applying these other things on top. Just, it's like literally like checking your work. It just yeah. keeps making you press against it. And you're going like, oh, okay. Yeah, the theme. I don't really have a good theme. I need a better theme. But once I start having a better theme, then I can go back to the inciting incident and the first act break and the climax and the midpoint and just be like, are these checking out? And then I'm like, okay, yeah, actually, that's really interesting. Or I tweak them a little bit. And then the Michael Arndt thing about the insanely great endings, I think is what it is. And maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, so then it's like, okay, is the ending doing it? And if the ending is not really popping, then how do I go back to the first act? It, you guys have read, I think you read Bardot, right? That's the mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. 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 So that's a really interesting thing that I've completed a movie that I think is thematically great and I love it. And I know that I have to rewrite the third act because it's ultimately boring. Have you guys ever experienced that where you're like, of course, it's, yeah, it's like, I right, did that. but yeah. it's not good. No, like nobody's going to want to, nobody's going to love this. Hmm. People might at a film festival and fucking Maryland might go, he really, he really took it home with that boring ass <laughs> ending. <laughs> but like, I was like, Oh fuck, I have to make this. I have to make an, a bomb go off here. Yeah. And that was really interesting to me. So like, and I just wrote that half hour about the three people meeting. And I wrote that and I was like, Structurally, it's perfect. Thematically, it's working. I'm bored, and I don't care. So mm-hmm. I went and watched Girls. I yeah. watched the pilot of Girls because I was like, oh, this is just <laughs> girls, but with these boys. Um, and that was really helpful just to be like, oh, right, you're not setting a, a trauma in the beginning. Because no. the opening of Girls, she is meeting with her parents, and they're like, we're cutting you off. And she's like, you can't cut me off. I'm, I need your money. Yeah. And they're like, too bad. Funny fact about that is an executive from HBO gave her that note 
because she didn't have that in the pilot at first, and uh, he's, and that that made it more complicated for the character. Um, what I'm reading this book called uh, "It's Not TV," and it's about HBO and how HBO oh, began its super fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Um, look, Adrian, mm. super fire always. Mm. We're gonna have to get you back when yeah. you come back uh, from around the world for part two mm-hmm. where can people find you if they need to find you can I, we get the socials I messed up my site but it's adriantodsnaga.com that's boring on uh, Twitter I get I don't even uh, that thing will melt down by the time this releases hopefully but uh, Instagram I've started using that with some mm-hmm. competence um, so I think I'm Adrian Todsniga. That's Z U N I G A or Z for uh, for all the Australians listening. That's right. Uh, but yeah, you can follow me there, and mostly just commenting on your guys' stuff. You know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, this has been so fun. I realize we talked too much about me and not enough about craft because now I'm no I'm like man, I want to talk about we'll, that shit forever. We'll, we'll have a part two talking about craft, yeah, but this this is about you. All that's right. right. And, and I'm glad to meet you in person. Yeah. And uh, Mel. Another great episode. Another great episode. Till next time. Bye. Two Writers Talking Shit is an original podcast created by Melanie Mars and Saeed Crumpton. Our producer is Kayla Guest. Our audio engineer is T. Kelly. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you damn well please. All we ask is that you subscribe, rate us five stars, and give us a glowing review. If you're not going to give us five stars or any glowing reviews, then why even log on? Save your rants for an open mic. If you have any questions for us, and I do mean any, you can email us at two writers talking shit at gmail.com. That's the number two, and then writers talking shit at gmail.com. See you next episode. Bye.